Hi, this is Mrs. Chavez. Um, we're on Chapter 29, Section 3, um, A Global Conflict. World War I was much more than a European conflict. Australia and Japan, for example, entered the war on the Allies' side, and India supplied troops to fight alongside their British rulers. Meanwhile, the Ottoman Turks, and later Bulgaria, allied themselves with Germany and the Central Powers. As the war promised to be a grim, drawn-out affair, all the great powers looked for other allies around the globe to tip the balance. They also sought new war fronts on which to achieve victory. As the war dragged on, the main combatants looked beyond Europe for a way to end the stalemate. However, none of the alliances they formed or new battlefronts they opened did much to end the slow and grinding conflict. A promising strategy for the Allies seemed to be to attack a region in the Ottoman Empire known as the Dardanelles. This narrow sea strait was the gateway to the Ottoman capital, Constantinople. By securing the Dardanelles, the Allies believed that they could take Constantinople, defeat the Turks, and establish a supply line to Russia, their ally. The effort to take the Dardanelles Strait began in February 1915. It was known as the Gallipoli Campaign. British, Australian, New Zealand, and French troops made repeated attacks on the Gallipoli Peninsula on the western side of the strait. Turkish troops, some commanded by German officers, vigorously defended the region. By May, Gallipoli had turned into another bloody stalemate. Both sides dug trenches from which they battled for the rest of the year. In December, the Allies gave up the campaign and began to evacuate. They had already suffered 250,000 casualties. In various parts of Africa and Asia, Germany's colonial possessions came under assault. The Japanese quickly overran German outposts in China. They also captured Germany's Pacific Island colonies. English and French troops attacked Germany's four African possessions, and they were able to seize control of three of them. Elsewhere in Asia and Africa, the British and French recruited subjects in their colonies for the struggle. Fighting troops as well as laborers came from India, South Africa, Senegal, Egypt, Algeria, and into China. Many fought and died on the battlefield. Others worked to keep the front lines supplied. To be sure, some colonial subjects wanted nothing to do with the European rulers' conflicts. Others volunteered in the hope that service would lead to their independence. This was the view of Indian political leader Mohandas Gandhi, who supported the Indian participation in the war. And finally, America joins the fight. In 1917, the focus of the war shifted to the high seas. That year, the Germans intensified the submarine warfare that had raged in the Atlantic Ocean since after the war began. In, 19, in January of 1917, the Germans announced that their submarines would sink without warning any ship in the water around Britain. This policy was called unrestricted submarine warfare. The Germans had tried this policy before. On May 7, 1915, a German submarine, or U-boat, had sunk the British passenger ship Lusitania. The attack killed 1,198 people, including 128 U.S. citizens. Germany claimed that the ship had been carrying ammunition, which later turned out to be true. Nevertheless, the American public was outraged. President Woodrow Wilson set a strong protest to Germany, and after two further attacks, the Germans finally agreed to stop attacking neutral and passenger ships. Des desperate for an advantage over the Allies, however, the Germans returned to unrestricted warfare in 1917. They knew it might lead to a war with the U.S., and they gambled that their naval blockade would starve Britain into defeat before the U.S. could mobilize. Ignoring warnings by President Wilson, German U-boats sank three American ships. In February 1917, Another German action pushed the U.S. closer to war. Officials intercepted a telegram written by German's Foreign Secretary, Arthur Zimmerman, stating that Germany would help Mexico reconquer the land it had lost to the U.S. if Mexico would ally itself with Germany. The Zimmerman Telegraph, as it's known, simply proved to be the last straw. A large part of the American population already favored the Allies. In particular, America felt a bond with, the Eng with England. The two nations shared a common ancestry and language, as well as similar democratic institutions and legal systems. More important, America's economic ties with the Allies were far stronger than those with the Central Powers. On April 2, 1917, President Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany. The U.S. entered the war on the side of the Allies. By the time the U.S. had joined the Allies, the war had been raging for nearly three years. In those three years, Europe had lost more men in battle than in all the wars of previous three centuries. The war had claimed the lives of millions and had changed countless lives forever. The Great War, as the conflict came to be known, affected everyone. It touched not only the soldiers in the trenches, but the civilians as well. World War I soon became a total war. This meant that countries devoted all their resources to the war effort. In Britain, Germany, 
Austria, Russia, and France, the entire force of the government was dedicated to winning the conflict. In each country, the wartime government took control of the economy. Governments told factories what to produce and how much. Numerous facilities were converted to munitions factories. Nearly every able-bodied civilian was put to work. Unemployment in many European countries all but disappeared. So many goods were in short supply that the government turned to rationing. Under this system, people could buy only small amounts of those items that were also needed for the war effort. Eventually, rationing covered a wide range of goods from butter to shoe leather. Governments also suppressed anti-war activities, sometimes forcibly. In addition, they censored news about the war. Many leaders feared that honest reporting of the war would turn people against it. Governments also used propaganda, one-sided information designed to persuade to keep up morale and support for the war. Total war meant that the government turned to help from women as never before. Thousands of women replaced men in, in factories, offices, and shops. Women built tanks and munitions, plowed fields, paved streets, and ran hospitals. They also kept troops supplied with food, clothing, and weapons. Although most women left the workforce when the war ended, they changed many people's views of what women were capable of doing. Women also saw the horrors of the war firsthand, working on or near the front line as nurses. American nurse Shirley Millard describes her experience with a soldier who had lost both his eyes and his feet. She said, he moaned through the bandages that his head was splitting with pain. I gave him morphine. Suddenly aware of the fact that he had numerous wounds, he asked, say, what's the matter with my legs? Reaching down to feel his legs before I could stop him, he uttered a heartbreaking scream. I held his hands firmly into the drug I had given him took effect. With the U.S. finally in the war, the balance it seemed was about to tip in the Allies' favor. Before that happened, however, events in Russia gave Germany a victory on the Eastern Front and a new hope for winning the conflict. In March 1917, civil unrest in Russia, due in a large part to war-related shortages of food and fuel, forced Tsar Nicholas to step down. In his place, a provisional government was established and pledged to continue fighting the war. However, by 1917, nearly 5.5 million Russian soldiers had been wounded, killed, or taken prisoner. As a result, the war-weary Russian army refused to fight any longer. Eight months after the new government took over, a revolution shook Russia. In November 1917, Communist leader Vladimir Ilyich Lenin seized power. Lenin insisted on ending his country's involvement in the war. One of the first acts was to offer Germany a truce. In March 1918, Germany and Russia signed the Treaty of brest litzbach which ended the war between them. Yeah. Russia's withdrawal from the war at last allowed Germany to send nearly all its forces to the Western Front. In March 1918, the Germans mounted one final massive attack on the Allies in France. As the opening weeks of the war, the German forces crushed everything in their path. Um, by May of 1918, the Germans had again reached the Marne River Valley. Paris was less than 40 miles away, and victory seemed within reach for Germany. By this time, however, though, the German military had weakened. The effort to reach the Marne had exhausted men and supplies alike. Sensing this weakness, the Allies, with the aid of nearly 140,000 fresh U.S. troops, launched a counterattack. In July 1918, the Allies and Germany clashed at the Second Battle of Marne leading the Allied attacks were some 350 tanks that rumbled slowly forward, smashing through the German lines. With the arrival of two million more American troops, the Allied forces began to advance steadily towards Germany. Soon the Central Powers began to crumble. First the Bulgarians, and then the Ottoman Turks surrendered. In October, revolution swept through Austria-Hungary. In Germany, soldiers mutinied, and the public turned on the Kaiser. On November 9, 1918, Kaiser Wilhelm II stepped down. Germany declared itself a republic. A representative of the new German government met with the French commander, Marshal Folk, in a railway car near Paris. The two signed an armistice, or an agreement to stop fighting. On November 11th, World War I finally came to an end. World War I was in many ways a new kind of war. It involved the use of new technologies. It ushered in the notion of war on a grand and global scale. It also left behind a landscape of death and destruction, such as was never seen before. Both sides in World War I paid a tremendous price in terms of human life. About 8.5 million soldiers died as a result of the war. Another 21 million were wounded. In addition, the war led to the death of countless civilians by way of starvation, disease, and slaughter. Taken together, these figures spelled tragedy. An entire generation of Europeans was wiped out. 
The war also had a devastating economic impact on Europe. The Great Conflict drained the treasuries of European countries. One account put the total cost of the war at $338 billion, a staggering amount for that time. The war also destroyed acres of farmland as well as homes and villages and towns. The enormous suffering that resulted from the Great War left a deep mark on Western society as well. A sense of disillusionment settled over the survivors. The insecurity and despair that many people experienced are reflected in the art and literature of the time. Another significant legacy of the war lay in its peace agreement. As you will find out in the next section, the treaties to end World War I were forged after great debate and compromise. And while they sought to bring a new sense of security and peace to the world, they prompted mainly anger and resentment.